I just want to set the stage just a little bit. Um, there's an elderly gentleman. If he were in our day, he'd probably be a boomer, uh, some, somewhere of that age. And, and he's a rabbi. And there's another rabbi in the text today. And if he were living in our day, he'd be a millennial. You kind of got the picture. And uh, the boomer is a very proud man. Uh, he would be like a senator in the United States Senate. Okay? He'd be a senator. Only the Senate then what was called the Sanhedrin, and it was a religious Senate because it was ruling in Jerusalem. And, and the other rabbi is kind of an upstart preacher, itinerant preacher. He's, he's not been to any formal training, but he, he knows his stuff. All right? Because uh, there was a man of the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees would have been like the right-wing relig- uh, a Republican party of, uh, of the uh, Sanhedrin, okay, uh, these rulers. And he's an extreme right-winger, legalistic, and all of that. Uh, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He's a ruler of the Jews. And uh, the same Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi. So he calls Jesus rabbi. Now this is really important because he's a distinguished man and he's calling this millennial kid rabbi. He says, we know that you are come from, that you are a teacher who has come from God for no man can do these miracles that you are doing except God be with him. Now Jesus, the rabbi, the younger one, he cuts right to the chase. It's like, I don't have time for committee meetings. Let's just text and get this over with, okay? So he jumps right, right to what he's after. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Nicodemus, he's the, I just don't get this young kid's language. He said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answers to him. He says, listen, I'm cutting right to the chase. I'm saying to you, except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, He cannot enter the kingdom of God. He goes on and says, that which is born of the flesh, that's what the water is, you know, there's uh, the waters representing your physical birth. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And, And then he adds this, he says, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. He says, listen, the wind blows wherever it wants to, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth, you have no idea where it's going next. He says, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. At this, Nicodemus responds, and he says unto him, how can these things be? The young millennial says to the seasoned boomer rabbi, you're a master teacher in Israel? I mean, you're supposed to know this stuff. And you do not know these things? He goes on to say, I say unto you, we speak that we do know, and we testify to that which we have seen, and you have not received our witness. He goes on to say, I told you earthly things, and you don't believe. How shall ye believe if I tell you Heavenly things. And to this he adds, And no man has ascended into heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Whoa. Jesus is theologizing. His favorite term for himself is Son of Man. Because he came from heaven for all eternity he was God. And so when he unites with his divine nature, a human nature, this is such a wonderful thing to Jesus. It's his favorite term, the Son of Man. But he tells us he's still divine because he says the Son of Man, which is, while he's talking right there to Nicodemus the rabbi, he said, I'm still in heaven. After saying that, he says, now listen, this is what it's all about. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's at this point in the reading of the Scriptures 
that scholars are not certain who's the speaker. Has Jesus just ended his discourse and John now begins to comment on it, or is Jesus still talking for this next verse? Personally, I'm of the opinion that John, the author of the book, now comments, for he slips right in and he says, for, he's, now John is talking, saying, I want to explain what Jesus was just doing with Nicodemus. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I chose the King James Version of the Bible because I wanted to read that verse that way. Okay? <laughs> All the other translations kind of change it just a little bit, but I wanted to read that verse that way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The next verse he goes on and says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already. No one is neutral. We stand under condemnation. Jesus didn't come to condemn us. We're, we're condemned already. He came to save us. He says, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, we stand condemned. That's a scripture reading. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of his word. I won't always do it that way, kind of running commentary of the scriptures. But I want to talk about three verses in the Bible that shape my life. And that was one of them. In that passage, there's a verse that has shaped my life. And that first verse is John 3, 16. We've already quoted it a couple times. For God so loved the world, we know that verse. It's my confession verse. Remember last week I talked about the three steps? The Jesus-built church is built upon the first step, the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. All right? The second foundation upon which it is built is the great commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. The third foundation that the church is built upon is the great commission, go and make disciples of all nations. Upon these three, well, my great confession is this verse right here, John 3, 16. It all started at the Brian Baptist Church in Detroit. That's where my parents took me for church. I started attending there when I was two years old. My brother started from birth, because he's younger than I am. <laughs> Not by much. <laughs> but it was at the Brian Baptist Church that they had a youth program called Christian Service Brigade. Anyone ever heard of that? Christian Service Brigade? I see a hand, a couple of hands, okay. Christian Service Brigade had two, two parts to it. Eight to 12-year-olds, which was called Stockade, and then Battalion, which was 13 to 18. I started at eight years old. My dad was one of the leaders in the program. And it was there that I got a memorization book. That's why you had crafts, you had Bible memory, Bible stories, and all that. And I had to memorize some verses. First verse I ever memorized on my own so that I could pass an award in the club was Isaiah 53, 6. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The second one was John 3, 16. Well, I just kept memorizing these verses every week, and by the end of the year, they started a new program that they didn't tell anybody about, but the, child, the, the young person who had memorized the most verses, they named him Honor Boy, so I was Honor Boy. But the award was a week at camp. They sent me for a week to camp, Kaskatawa. Now, I've already looked. I've camped. I'm a big believer in camp. You're going to see why in a few moments. But on May 15th, is going to be our camp day here, Camp Lael. I am pro-camping, and you're going to see why in a few moments. They sent me to Camp Kaskatawa for a week, and I went on the internet and I found a picture. It's the same place where I went to camp at, and you can see that they're out there, there's a bonfire going on, and every evening they had a bonfire, and every evening they got, somebody got up and gave a lesson, and this one particular evening, when I was eight years old, the preacher, Elgin Green, um, we called him Cap Green because he was captain of the camp. And, and Cap Green got up and, and told the Bible story. At the end, he did a Billy Graham-styled invitation. All of you who are interested in receiving Jesus as your Savior, raise your hand. I raised my hand, and some other kid raised his hand. And uh, he said, okay, everybody else, you can go to the, I think they call it the pop shop. You go to the pop shop, and there are snacks and all that. 
but you two stick around. And we did. We went down by the campfire and went at the campfire, and there's nobody there but Cap Green and myself and this other fellow, and I don't know his name. But, uh, and, and they're at that campfire. He got his Bible out, and, and he turned it to John chapter 3, and he started reading this verse that I had memorized to go to camp. But he read it in the most unusual way. He said, for God, he stopped and looked at me and said, Dennis, do you know who that is? Well, I said, yeah, that's the creator. God created everything. I apparently got that right because he continued on. <laughs> he said, for God so loved the world. He said, Dennis, do you know who the world is? I, I, he asked the other kid, but I don't know his name, so I'm going to kind of drop him out of the story. He said, he, said, he said, Dennis, do you know who the world is? I said, well, the world is everybody. I answered that correctly. So he says to me, he says, well, if that's true, it's everybody, is that you? And I said, well, yeah, that would be me. He said, so let's reread this verse. He said, for God so loved, and then he, 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 instead of putting the word world in there, he put my name in there. He said, for God so loved Dennis that he gave his only begotten son. And he said, uh, Dennis, do you know who that is? Well, you know, I, I know the answer to this, but it's like I'm tired of asking, answering all the questions. The other kid's not chiming in at all. And so I just, I don't say anything. He doesn't say anything. Finally, he said, well, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And I knew that answer. He says, uh, he goes on. Hey, for God so loved you, Dennis, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him. He said, do you know who whosoever is? Now I'm playing dumb now. I know the answer to this. But this guy's just, I mean, this is like quiz back and forth. And he says, it's anybody who will. And he said, Dennis, will you believe in Jesus as your Savior? I said, yes. He said, well, if you will, you can put your name in there. And he backed up. And he said, for God so loved Dennis that he gave his only begotten son, that if Dennis believes in him, as he continued reading, he inserted my name in again. He says, if you believe in him, Dennis should not perish, but Dennis should have everlasting life. And this verse was no longer a memorized verse or a verse just on the page. He had applied it specifically to my life, and he asked me, would you like to make Jesus Christ your Savior tonight? And I said, I would. And he said, then pray with me and ask him to be your Lord and Savior. I prayed and asked him to be my Lord and Savior. This is where the story gets good. That night, by the campfire, no lights, just the light of the campfire, open Bible, on my knees, praying with Cap Green, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. The next day, I went to the camp pop shop, and they had some postcards there. Now, my mom had put some stationery in my suitcase, self-addressed envelope. Um, it, it, it had a stamp on it, pages. And I, I knew I couldn't write a letter. I just wasn't that. that. But when I saw the postcard... And so there was that little, like, little three-inch square spot. I said, I could fill that up. <laughs> and so I bought that. Uh, I bought that postcard because I was going to write my mom. And I bought a New Testament. The New Testament had the Christian Service Brigade logo on it. Um, but it wasn't in color like that. It was embossed. But I couldn't find one. So I took a Gideon Bible to show you. I bought it. And I, I bought that New Testament. And I thought I'd put it with me here today. Brought it with me. I did. The cover is gone. <laughs> I bought this Bible, and uh, I bought the postcard. And, and, and uh, you can tell I, I, I kind of use that Bible from then on when I go to church. And, and, but on the back of the postcard, I wrote home to my mom. Now, I don't know if you can make that out. Uh, Mrs. William Henderson. And the nice part about this stamp was only three cents. A long time ago, all right? And I wrote, Mom, I said at the very beginning, Monday I took guns. I think they were BB guns. <laughs> I took guns, and I got 17 points. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> I mean, if that's like out of 100, I was a failure, okay? But it must have been good. The rest is really hard to read, because on the original postcard, it's erased, and I tried to magnify it and bring it out. It says, uh, I'll send a letter pretty soon. 
I got, and I wasn't sure about this next one. You can see it's been erased and rewritten. I finally settled on, I got staved. <laughs> Not saved, I got staved yesterday. My mom saved this postcard when it arrived. You know, then uh, I don't know if it was at my ordination when she gave this to me, but uh, I still have a postcard. I don't bring it out. I just, I put it out like that. And, and uh, I got staved. I didn't even know how to spell the word, but I knew what Jesus said. It was a while later that somebody said, well, you know, uh, you know what the word staved means, don't you? Uh, the word stave is a board. I mean, there's lumber companies called the stave company. And uh, they said, it wasn't you that got staved, it was Jesus that got staved. Jesus got staved. It was Jesus that laid down on the cross as were nailed to the cross. But then I came across that passage in Galatians chapter 2.20 where it says, um, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So there's a real sense that I got saved for God so loved the world that he staved his only begotten Son for me. For me. I accept the Lord Jesus Christ at eight years old, same camp, about four years later. I came back from camp and told our pastor I wanted to be baptized. I was baptized at the Brian Baptist Church there that I showed you the picture of and became a member of the church. This is my confession verse, but you know it can be your confession verse too. All you got to do is insert your name in there. And this is so true. I mean, Christianity's we're about the love of God. That's what we're about. And I want to do this. I want us all to read this verse together, but, and we're going to sound charismatic, and that's okay. Uh, I want you to put your name in where it says your name. Not my name, your name, all right? And so read this with me, okay? For God so loved Dennis that he gave his only begotten son that if Dennis believes in him, Dennis should not perish but have everlasting life. Is that awesome or what? That's, that, to, that's what the gospel's about. God loved me so much. He gave his son that he would rescue me and save me and have a relationship with me. That's my confession verse. Now, as my life progressed, I, I'd like to be able to say that I was, and my brother would tell you I was, the model child. <laughs> and in fact, as I grew a little older, I learned. One time I heard my brother say to some friends, he said, you know what I like best about being my, my Dennis's brother? I said, no. I said, He's got more creative ways to get in trouble. <laughs> My mom rightly named me Dennis the Menace, I guess. But I, I, as a teenager, which sometimes happens, teenagers begin to wander away from the Lord, and, and that happened to me. And, and I, I claim John 3.16 as my conversion verse. And Philippians 3.13 and 14, I know it's two verses, but I, I claim that as my life verse. My life verse. I want to read it first. It says, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's an odd verse for a teenager to pick, you would probably say, but it says, Forgetting those things which are behind. I had some things that I wanted to forget. You don't know this person. It's not me. It's a friend of mine. That's the last picture I took of him. His name is Ray Bakiel. And Ray Backiel and I met in a, a Cody High School gym. We, were, we would bet on our shots playing double or nothing in gym, shooting baskets. And you wind up, you, you end up with nothing in the end. So it was just a thing that we did. I met him in gym. And, and he stopped by my house one day because he'd just gotten a brand new Triumph 650. Nice motorcycle. We'd been out cruising on it. And, and then uh, he hopped off and... And his, his helmet was on it, and he were in the pool. And that's why I had that picture of the pool. He looks over at the motorcycle and says, oh, it's terrible. I said, what are, what's wrong with you, man? That is one beautiful bike. And he says to me, I said, no, no. The helmet is white, and my motorcycle tanks are black. What a clash in colors. <laughs> he said, we need to paint it. I said, oh, yeah, let's paint it. And so he says, hey, you know, Ron... And it turned out, I, there's a kid that sat next to me in Spanish class. Ron Kopaz works at his uncle's paint shop. And I bet we can 
get him and we go over and we can paint it in the paint shop and get a professional paint shop. So we did. We, we jumped in my car. I told you about my car last week that I led the fellow to the Lord in. And uh, it was a 1932 Willys Overland. Now listen, I'm not as old. That wasn't a brand new car when I bought it. <laughs> it wasn't. That car was already an antique. My dad helped me get it running. My mom helped me restore the interior. And, and, and uh, uh, later I sold it to my brother, and he used it for years. And, and, uh, but we jumped in my car because we had to pick up Ron. Three of us couldn't ride on the motorcycle. So we jumped in my, we jumped in my car, and we drove to the paint factory. And the paint factory, I'm having a hard time clicking that. There we go. The paint factory uh, is the Copass paint factory. And uh, it's still there. This, uh, I took this off the internet, picture of the shop. We, it was dark out by the time we got there. We slipped in the back doors. Not, you can't see them on here. You see the side door. And we went in, and, and we turned on the machine that uh, degreased and, and uh, but we didn't turn the tap on that kept the chemicals in it. Like I said, if we don't do that, the place will fill up and we'll get, we'll get high. It'll be, you know. And sure enough, and we were as high as could be, all right? And we were doing some weird things and painting in that place. I think we actually did paint the helmet, but I, I don't know. But because <laughs> the last thing I know is that I was gone. <laughs> and uh, next morning... When the owner of the shop, Ron's uncle, came in, he opened the door, he hit my body laying on, on the pavement. And uh, he called the fire department, police department, ambulance, and I wound up going to, uh, I, I wound up going to St. Mary's Hospital. And uh, when I arrived at St. Mary's Hospital, I was okay, but my two friends were pronounced dead. Just from having kids fun. There's a big difference, though. My mom, that night, realized that I hadn't come home. My mom would often say, now, Dennis was a, uh, he, could, he could cause some trouble, but he always came home. And I didn't come home that night. And she said, well, you know what I'm going to do? Because my bedroom was on the back of the house, had its own doorway. She said, I'm just going to go hop into bed, his bed. When he comes sneaking in through that back door into the room, he's just going to climb into bed with mom. <laughs> and she's got this all figured out. And, uh, but then I didn't come home, I didn't come home. So my mom prayed all night long for her son. I was in the same circumstances as my two friends in every way. My mom prayed. God heard her prayer. I believe in prayer. Amen? It was amazing. The doctor said once, uh, they, the hospital called and said, if you want to see your son alive, you better get here as fast as you can. And... Uh, but my mom, she got on the phone. She called every church she knew that had a prayer chain. I said, pray for my son. So when they arrived, uh, I, you know, obviously I'm alive, so <laughs> I didn't die. But um, my dad came, and, and uh, I had all these fumes on me. They were so strong, my dad passed out just from the fumes on me leaning over, trying to get me to talk. But I was really unconscious for like three days. But my mom was the prayer warrior that got me through that. I believe in prayer. We will be a church of prayer. We're at the St. Mary's Hospital. It was a Catholic hospital, so they administered extreme unction. First, they had to baptize me to be Catholic so I could have extreme unction. <laughs> and and uh, so they went through the process, and then I fooled them, and all I lived, or at least God fooled them. He said, no, I still have something for him to do. And... Uh, I was in the newspaper, that, and that's my junior high picture, not my high school picture, but uh, that uh, I made it. My two friends did not. I had something I needed to forget. And I didn't want survivor syndrome, you know, that you're the survivor and you can't ever get past your past. 
And I was at the Temple Baptist Church one Sunday, and they had a guest speaker, and I don't know who he was, and he was preaching, and as he was preaching, you know sometimes you just check out of the sermon? Oh, am I the only one that does that? <laughs> you, know, you know how that happens? You just kind of, you're going along, and well, as soon as the preacher quoted this verse, forgetting those things which are behind, I checked out. I looked up that passage. I read those verses. Right on the spot, I start memorizing those verses. You know, and I got these memorized King James Version. That's why I got King James here, because that's what they were using in the day at the church. He said, forgetting those things which are behind. In Paul's case, he had things he needed to forget. Persecuting the church, incarcerating Christians, and a lot of things. And I had something I felt like I really need to let go of. But he says, it's not enough just to let go. He says, but, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I'm letting go of that and reaching forth. But what is it? It's like he, he's a runner and he's in a race and life is the race. And he said, I've got, I've got things in my life I've got to let go of. And I'm striving. And he says, I have a goal. I have a target. There's a mark that I'm shooting at. And he says, and I press towards that. With all my energy, I'm pressing towards that. I'm not looking back. I press towards the mark for what? He says, it's for the prize. The prize of the high calling. That one day I'll stand before Jesus, and Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. This is my life verse. I don't dwell too much in the past. Today I am, but you won't, and I'll tell stories from the past, but I'm really a future-oriented person. Bethany's had a great history. That's wonderful. I think the glory days are ahead. I do. I believe the glory days are ahead. And that God is going to do a great work here. I believe that, all right? Pressing towards the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, that life verse has led me. It led me to Baptist Bible College, led me to Baptist Bible Seminary, led me to Westminster Seminary, led me to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. It, it also led me in ministry. And, and, and while I was in seminary, I was attending the Whitehall Baptist Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And uh, I got there on Labor Day weekend. When I arrived on Labor Day weekend, uh, I said, well, we've got to find a church to go to. Uh, and so on that Labor Day, a Monday, I saw this little church in the neighborhood where I found an apartment so I could go to seminary. And uh, there was no sign on it as there is now for the time. And so I said, well, I'm just going to walk up to the building. They did. I mean, it's, it's a Monday. As I went to that side door, not the front door, the side door, and you can kind of see the railing there. Just as I went to open the, you know, to see if the door was open, the door opened and out came a rear end at me. <laughs> and I'm backing up. The guy was cleaning the church, and he was bending over, and he's sweeping the last bit. And so, and so I'm backing up because he's going to rear end me, okay? And, and so I, I, he says to me, I, I said, well, we introduce each other. And, and so the guy's name is Don, and I say, hey, I'm a seminary student. I was just wanting to figure out the time of service because do you have a midweek service? We'll come for a midweek service. And, and he, he says, he finds out I'm a seminary student. He said, well, we're without a pastor. You want to be our pastor? I'm not even there. He's never heard me speak other than hello. And he's, and he's already offering. And he's on the search committee. He's asking me, do I want to be, <laughs> do I want to be the pastor? I said, well, I'm, I'm a seminary student. I'm going to Westminster Seminary. And I said, uh, I, I'm kind of stunned by this. Well, anyway, we, we go to the church there. And they, they call in an, a transitional minister uh, from Philadelphia College of the Bible, one of the professors. And he kept saying, hey, you ought to consider this guy that's in the church. Well, they had, but they, he kept saying this. And, and before the school year is over, uh, they take me on as pastor. And that's the Whitehall Baptist Church in Philadelphia. My wife and I, we attended there. Well, we went there, viewed it uh, not too long ago, maybe about five years or so ago. Um, but, but while I was at, at the church there, it just seemed to be stymied. It wasn't going anywhere. And I'm struggling. I don't know who to ask. I don't know people in this area. And I, I, you know, there's a couple of pastors, but I don't know them very well. I said, well, man, where, where could I find some help? Well, there's uh, pastoral epistles in the Bible. Why don't I just read 
the instruction in the Bible to pastors. So I sat down, and I'm reading through 1 Timothy, and I came to this verse, and it was just like I was at the Temple Baptist Church. I checked out of everything else and focused on this one verse, and this is like my ministry verse. Pay close attention to yourself. I can't make a church grow. That's Jesus' business. I, I, I can't convert a soul. That's Jesus' work. But I can pay close attention to myself. And the second part of this is, and to your teaching. Now, I got a Bible here. Teaching is the word of God. Pay close attention to yourself. In James it says the Bible is like a mirror. When you read the Bible, it, you see yourself in this book. He says, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. The teaching's in the Word. And so I look at the Word, I look at my life. I look at the Word, I look at my life. I look at the Word. He said, be more concerned that you are living what you preach than what you're teaching what you preach. I get that from the next part. Continue in these things. Continue. Persevere. Keep doing this. It, it was almost like Jesus was saying, it's not your job to build the church. I will build my church. Your job is to just pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching and make sure your life matches what the Word says. And if you do that, he says, for in doing this, you will both save yourself. And here's the part that I wanted. And you will save your hearers. Your hearers. God is going to do a work in the church when a preacher just pays attention to himself and to the teaching of the Word, and he does it, he lives it, he just doesn't preach it and teach it. It's a reality in his life. And uh, God blessed in that church. It turned around, began to grow. I went to another church, Shawnee Hills Baptist Church, down in Jamestown, Ohio. Every church I was at was a church in decline, and when I pay close attention to myself and to the teaching of the Word, and I teach the Word, Jesus builds his church. Jesus builds his church. Shawnee Hills broke the difficult 200 barrier. Today it's running about four or 500 people. God just continued to bless that church. I went to First Baptist Church in Pontiac. The Stemples were here. We had an awesome singles ministry going there. There were more singles got baptized in the church than the rest of the whole church combined. I think the measure of a church growing is how many people are being baptized by coming to faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, publicly identifying him with baptism. First Baptist Church in Muskegon, pay close attention to yourself, to your teaching. Let Jesus build his church. In four years, church doubled. Over 50 baptisms in that four years. All right. Emmanuel Baptist Church in Ypsilanti, I was transitional minister. West Haven, I was a transitional minister. First Baptist, transitional minister. All just waiting waiting, waiting, waiting to come to Bethany Baptist Church. <laughs> this is my story. I might add I'm sticking to it, okay? But this is my story, all right? But I'm interested in your spiritual journey too. Every one of us should have a salvation verse. It was a verse that God used. Maybe it was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It wasn't John 3.16. Uh, maybe it's some other verse about, where it was that verse, that, 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 that passage that God hit you between the eyes and said you need Jesus as your Savior. We all ha have to have that in our life somewhere where we've had an encounter with Christ and he saved us. Maybe you have a life verse. That life verse that I have, I, I mean, there's so many people that got things they want to forget. An abusive child relationship, you know, somebody abused them, a financial disaster. I, I don't know what it is. And I don't know what's been in your history, but if I hear your story, I tell you, I can find you a verse. <laughs> the, the Bible's pretty big. There's a lot of verses in there. It might be in the book of Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. He said, that's my verse. God's got a plan for my life. I, I don't know what it'll be, but we need a verse. 
That's the anchor. When, when things aren't really going well, and you say, but I got my verse. It's my anchor. It's my soul. It's my life verse. I cling to this. And I just so happen to have a ministry verse because I've hung on to that. My ministry is about, I got to first pay close attention to myself and to the teaching. And if, if, I'm, if I'm more than just teaching it, but I'm living it, the promise, the promise in that passage is it'll not just save me, it'll save my hearers. And I want others to come to Jesus too. I want others to come to Jesus too. That brings me to the end of my story here. We're looking to, towards the next phase of the journey, the next phase of the journey here at Bethany. Let's pray. Father in heaven, my desire today has been through the word of God to just share the life verses that impact my life. There are verses that impact their lives too. But my desire was them to get to know who I am. Last week, Lord, I, I shared my model of ministry, and this week, a little more who I am. And Father, I just pray that uh, all of us would find those anchors for our soul, a conversion verse, a life verse, and even a ministry verse. That I can hang on to those and I can describe my life. You gave them to me, you can give them to them. May we all have uh, that one same purpose, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, love our neighbors as ourselves. Bless in this way, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Next week, I'm going to have a message called Come and See. So you got to come and see what I'm talking about next week, okay? <laughs> come and see. Come and see. Invite someone to come with you as well.